In this question, we have an alpha particle that is traveling in a circular path of radius 4.5 centimeters in a uniform magnetic field, and they gave us the magnitude of that magnetic field. In part A, we need to calculate the speed of the alpha particle. Now, the book undergoes a derivation of an equation that can be used to find the speed of a charged particle that's moving along in a circular path. So, this is that equation. We're going to derive this equation and figure out where it comes from, but for those who are more interested in jumping to the answer, you can skip a couple minutes ahead. But let's consider where this equation comes from, for those who are interested. And if you have a charged particle that's moving around in a circular path, and in this case it's a positively charged particle, well, in order for it to continue moving around in a circular path, there needs to be a force that keeps it on that circular path. We call that force a centripetal force, and we know that the centripetal force points towards the center of the circular path. We can label that force F sub C. And the question is, what's providing that centripetal force? And what is providing that centripetal force is the magnetic force. There is a magnetic field present here. We have a charged particle. And when you have a charged particle that's traveling perpendicularly through a magnetic field, it's going to experience a magnetic force. And we have learned in this chapter that the magnetic force magnitude is equivalent to the charge times the speed times the magnetic field strength. There's also a sign of an angle term on there, but because the charged particle is traveling in a direction that's perpendicular to the magnetic field, the angle would be 90, and the sign of 90 is just 1. So we can write the magnitude of the magnetic force as QVB. That is the centripetal force, and according to Newton's second law, the centripetal force must equal the mass times the centripetal acceleration. But perhaps in your previous physics studies, you've learned that the centripetal acceleration is equivalent to the speed squared divided by the radius. And so now we can start to see where that equation from earlier is going to come from. We can divide both sides by v, or multiply by 1 over v. That's going to cancel the v on this side and one of the factors of v on the right-hand side. So now we have qb is equal to mv over r. And through a little bit of algebraic manipulation, we could solve for r, and we would get mv divided by qb. That's where that equation comes from. But in fact, in part a, we need to calculate the speed of this charged particle. So we're going to solve this for speed. We're going to just cross multiply. So mv times 1 is mv. And then we have rqb when we cross multiply in the other direction. And then you divide both sides by the mass. So now you have the speed is equal to r times q times b divided by the mass of the alpha particle. Now, these values are known. The radius was given, the magnetic field, the charge, and the mass. For the mass, we're going to have to do a special conversion. They said that the mass was four atomic mass units, and then they gave us the sort of conversion factor there. So what we'll do when we plug in mass is that conversion. And then in addition, when we plug in the charge, it says positive 2e. We have to remember that e is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19th coulombs. We're going to go ahead now and plug all the values in. So there we have it. One thing we didn't note yet is that for the radius, that was given in centimeters. It was 4.5 centimeters, so we multiplied the radius by 10 to the minus 2 to convert it into meters. So all of the conversions into standard units are in order here, and now when we calculate that, we're going to see that the speed is around 2.6 times 10 to the power of 6, and that's going to be in meters per second, standard unit of speed. That is the correct answer for part A. And in part B, we are asked to calculate its period of revolution. So a period of revolution. So that basically just means the time required to travel once around this circle. Now, we know that speed, just in general, speed is equal to a distance divided by a time. And because this particle is moving on a circular path, the distance around the path would be the circumference of the circle. So that would be 2 pi times the radius. And then the time is going to be what we're looking for. They often use a capital T when denoting the period. So we can do a little algebraic manipulation here. You basically just swap the V and the T, and we can see that the period is going to be the circumference divided by the speed. We can go ahead and plug in the radius and the speed we calculated in part A. And when we compute that, we can see the period is approximately 1.09 times 10 to the minus 7. This is going to be in seconds. So that's how long it would take for the charged particle to go one trip around the circular path. Not a lot of time at all. Now we can look at part C, which is asking us to find the kinetic energy 
of this charged particle. Now, we know, again, from earlier physics studies, perhaps, that the kinetic energy of a moving body is equal to one-half times its mass times its speed squared. We have all of these values, so we'll go ahead and plug in. And when we compute this, we get a kinetic energy of approximately 2.25 times 10 to the minus 14. The standard unit of energy is joules, though your homework system might want you to convert this into a different energy unit known as the electron volt. So we're going to do a conversion into electron volts, and it turns out that one electron volt is equivalent to 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. And if we set up the conversion factor in that manner, the joules that we're starting out with and the joules in the denominator of our conversion factor will cancel out. So we do that conversion and we end up with approximately 1.4 times 10 to the power of five electron volts. So this would be the correct answer for part C. In part D, we are asked to find the potential difference through which it would have to be accelerated to achieve this energy. Okay, so we need some kind of relationship between potential difference, the charge, and the energy. And perhaps in an earlier chapter you learned that the work done to accelerate a charged particle across a potential difference is equal to the charge times that potential difference. Now in this case the work that's being done is used to give the charged particle its kinetic energy. So, as you know, when you do work on something, you change its energy. Sometimes you change its potential energy when you do work. Sometimes you change its kinetic energy. In this case, we're changing its kinetic energy. So for the work term, we can fill in the kinetic energy. And then if we divide both sides of this equation by the charge, then we will have a nice expression to calculate the potential difference. And when we do this, for the kinetic energy, we're going to want to plug in the standard unit that we found earlier. So 2.25 times 10 to the minus 14th joules, and then divide that by the charge. And when we do that, we get approximately 7.0 times 10 to the power of 4. We're using standard units, so the standard unit of potential difference is volts. So this would be the correct answer to part D.